do bid everyone welcome this Wednesday evening to our midweek Bible study. We thank you very much for joining with us and we pray the Lord will be one of our number uh, wherever we might be and draw near to us and grant us his blessing. So we're glad to have you join with us and we thank you very much for tuning in and being part of the broadcast this evening. We're going to commence with 614 as our opening hymn. Glorious things of thee are spoken. Zion city of our God, he whose word cannot be broken, formed thee for his own abode. It's 614 and as the practice is, the words will be on the screen. to bow together in prayer and wait upon the Lord. Our Father, we do bow this evening in thy presence. We come humbling ourselves before thee and seeking thee, drawing nigh into thy courts. O Lord, thou art God in heaven, and we are here on earth, and yet there is a way in a real and true sense in which we can draw near to thee. O Lord, we enter in through that rent veil. We come by the way of shed blood, as it is pictured for us in the tabernacle and in the temple, which thy word tells us are figures and shadows of things above. 
And Lord, we thank thee the veil is rent in twain, and we have boldness to enter in. We thank thee for our great high priest, who has entered in with the blood of his own sacrifice. And Aaron took in that blood that could never take away sins, and was only a type and a shadow and picture of one who was to come, who would shed his own blood, and put away sin by one sacrifice of himself. And we thank thee, therefore, that our forerunner has entered in for us. And therefore we come in his wake, we come that path that he has opened up, we come to the throne of God. And it is for us a throne of mercy and grace tonight. It is a place, Lord, where we can come to, we can cry and seek thee, we can call upon thee in prayer. We thank thee there is acceptance in him. There is a welcome extended to us. We are not banished, Lord. We're not cast out tonight. But we have that a great privilege of being accepted and heard of thee. And we pray that thou will remember us and bless each one of us as we come before thee, as we come around the word of God this evening, and then around the throne of grace. We pray that thou will help us, enable us, O Lord. Bless thy word to our hearts. May that prompt us and direct us even as we come to pray. And then as we call upon thee, we pray that thou would hear in heaven my dwelling place. Come, Lord, and work in these times. Have mercy upon this day and age, this generation, Lord, that uh, we are found among, a generation that uh, does not know thee and has not set its hope in God, a generation, O Lord, that's turning away from thee more and more and trampling underfoot all the privileges and the blessings that have come through, it, uh, come to it through the gospel. But Lord, we pray that thou would send us a breath of revival, Come again, Lord, and move in this land and nation. And we pray that thou would prosper thy word as it is sounded forth uh, tonight from many places. Lord, we thank thee that here and there across the land there will be midweek meetings taking place and the word of God will be preached. And we pray that thou would own thy word, Lord, and use it. Oh, we need that, O oh Lord, in these times. Uh, we pray that... Thou would take up thy truth, Lord, and be pleased to especially bless it and make it a saving and a sanctifying word in hearts and lives. So tarry with us this evening as we are now before thee. Grant us thy blessing as we continue on uh, in thy presence. May we know the Lord drawing near to us personally and individually. Let that be our experience this evening. Lord, may we know what it is to meet with thee. May we be able to testify of such and that our hearts are blessed and made glad. O oh Lord, may that be true. Give us that uh, burning of heart like those two on the Emmaus Road. May we so desire thy presence and, and know and experience it that we will indeed rejoice and be glad. So tarry with us, we pray now. We ask in our Saviour's worthy name. Amen. Amen. 310 is going to be our next hymn. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed through his infinite mercy, his child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. 310, do join in as you see the words on the screen.
turning this evening to Revelation chapter 3 for our Bible reading and study. We're continuing on to think about the promises that have been made to uh, the overcomer in the seven letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor. So we're coming to the sixth one uh, this evening. And therefore we're going to read from this chapter, Revelation chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 7 down to verse 13. So Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and has kept my word, and has not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Amen. We'll end there. I know the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his word to all of our hearts uh, this evening. It's verse 12 that contains this promise that we want to come to consider uh, this evening, the promise to the overcomer that is here mentioned to the church at Philadelphia. We started out in this study uh, thinking about that uh, term that appears in Romans chapter 8 and verse 37. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And we were thinking as well of the promise that Jacob made to his son Gad when he said a, a troop shall overcome him but he shall overcome at the last. And that very much is a picture of each and every child of God. There are setbacks and there are defeats along the way. Uh, no Christian ever is entirely victorious in their, their walk with God. We still live in this sinful world and in a sinful body too. And therefore there are times when we are tripped up and where we are overcome. But we shall overcome at the last. That's the great truth that we are dwelling upon, the promise to the overcomer. And that brings us then to uh, this particular promise in this verse uh, 12 of Revelation chapter 3 this evening. As it stands, it's the promise that is given to the church at Philadelphia. Now this church was one of those commended uh, churches. There was only two churches commended out of the seven uh, that had no rebukes uh, in these seven letters. And Philadelphia is one of those uh, churches. For example, there in verse 8, it says, I know thy works. Behold, I've set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. So here the great king and sole head of the church has this to say about this particular church. Thou hast a little strength, but thou hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. And that's a commendation indeed. In many ways, this this um, church was like a city set upon the hill. You'll think of that term as the Lord Jesus used it over in Matthew's Gospel in the Sermon on the Mount. Well, literally, physically, this, this city was indeed up upon a, a, a terrace. It was almost a thousand feet above sea level, 925 feet uh, above sea level. It was on the lower slopes of Mount Timolus. And there was a, a terrace, and on this, this, this terrace, it was a, a large river valley, uh, feeding down ultimately out into to the ocean. But up on, up on that uh, terrace, like a, like a ledge, there was this city that, that was built. 
And in a physical sense, it was indeed a city set upon a hill. Could be seen for for miles and miles around. It was 20 miles southeast from Sardis. It was 105 miles east from the coastal city of Smyrna that we were thinking about the letter to that particular church a a little while ago. But whatever can be said about the church in the physical uh, sense, it can certainly be said in the spiritual sense that it was a city set upon a hill. Because here's a church that was a, a shining light in that part of the world. They'd kept the word of the Lord. The word of his patience is how it is described there in verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. So this church is is being commended. It has only got a little strength, but it has kept the Lord's word. It has not denied his name. It has kept the word of his patience. And so the Lord is here commending this church. But it's also a commissioned church. And that's a reference to those words where the Lord said, I have set before thee an open door, verse 8. Behold, I have set before thee an open door and no man can shut it. There was an open door that was set before this church. And that would suggest that this church had a, a great opportunity presented to it. And that open door it would seem had something to do with the church being spared, the hour of temptation. You'll see that in uh, verse 10 as it follows on. I, will, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. So here was a promise that was made to this church that the Lord was going to keep this church from the hour of temptation while other churches it would seem, other Christians, other individuals who who know the Lord were going to face this hour of temptation. Yet the Lord makes this specific promise to the church at Philadelphia and he says, I'm going to keep you. I'm going to keep you in the hour of temptation. I'm going to keep you from the hour of temptation. Not only keep you in the hour He would do that for others. But he says he's going to keep this church from the hour of temptation. And it would seem that this is the open door then that is presented to this church. Because here is a wonderful opportunity presented to this church to witness for Christ and to seek the furtherance of the gospel and advancement of the kingdom of heaven. The Lord had set before them an open door in that sense. Here's here's a golden opportunity. Peaceful times. For the church of Jesus Christ are indeed to be used for the advancement of the gospel and the kingdom of God. Peaceful times are not an occasion to take it easy and to relax and somehow just you know, drift along. No, that is not how it ought to be with the church at all. Peaceful times ought to be that season that is looked upon as a golden opportunity, a golden season, an open door as it is described here in Revelation 3 and verse 8. An open door for them to bear witness for Christ without the, the hour of temptation being upon them. So it was a commissioned church. And the Lord had set before them the open door and they were to to go through that door. No man can shut it, is the promise that is given in verse 8. Behold, I have set before thee an open door and no man can shut it. But then also there, it's a commanded church. This church at Philadelphia in verse 11 was commanded to hold, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man Take thy crown. Hold that fast which thou hast. They were not to give ground. They were to hold on. Hold on to the faith. Hold on to the truth. Hold on to that zeal that they have. The love of the brethren as the name Philadelphia uh, suggests. And all of these things they were to hold fast. Lest someone would take their crown. Oh the Lord is warning them not to, not to lose their crown. By letting go and, and, and giving up those things that they had. Holding fast pleases the Lord. Oh, it might be dismissed in some circles even today as narrow-mindedness and a sectarian spirit at times. Even when we hold fast to certain things, 
The Lord is pleased when we hold fast. He would have his church to hold fast and not to give up certain things, not to change, not to water down certain things. In this day of compromise and forsaking of the truth of God and abandoning of the word of God is the final rule of faith and practice. The church of Jesus Christ is to hold fast, hold fast the things that we have. We're to hold the faith that is ha- as it has been revealed to us in Holy Scripture. We are not to give up one iota of it. Not one iota of it are we to give up for an easy life or for the well-being and or the, the well-done of someone else who won't hold to these things. We, we are not to do that. We are to hold fast because the Lord is pleased with such a spirit. And may we even be reminded of that in these times in which we are found in this day and age, that the Lord will enable us to hold fast. And to that individual who holds fast, there is then the promise that is made here to the overcomer in verse 12. Him that overcometh. And we can understand and tie up here that the overcomer is the individual who's holding fast. So if we're giving up and, and letting go of certain things that, that the Lord has given us in his word and have come down to us from previous generations, then we're not, we're not overcoming. If we give those things up, we are not overcoming. We're only overcoming here according to this portion of scripture if we're holding fast those things that we have. And to the overcomer then... There is made this promise that I want us to consider this evening. And I trust that as we do so, the Lord will indeed bless his word as we consider it. I want you first of all here to consider that the overcomer shall be described as a temple pillar. A temple pillar. He'll be described as such. To him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Now what the temple of God is here can be discerned by going no further than the book of the Revelation. Because there's, there's a number of possibilities set before us here in the book of the Revelation as to what the temple of God is. For example, if you turn over to chapter 11 and verse 1, it says, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God. And the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall, be, shall they tread under foot forty and two months. So there is a temple of God here on earth. It's connected with the city of Jerusalem, the holy city. It's connected with that city that is going to be trodden down forty and two months by the Gentiles. Three and a half years. And that's referring to that end end time period just prior to the coming of the Lord when Antichrist will turn upon the Jew and there will be a time of great tribulation, great persecution and they will indeed tread the city down 14 two months. There's a temple of God in that holy city. So there's a temple of God here on earth. That wouldn't seem to be the one that is here uh, referenced in uh, chapter 3 and verse 2 with regards to the promise of the overcomer. If you go down to chapter 11, verse 19, you will come upon the second of these temples. It says, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. And that's a reference just prior to the coming of the Lord. But it mentions there in the opening line, The temple of God was opened in heaven. So there's a temple of God in heaven here, it would suggest to us. Now when we think about what is it that marks the temple? Well, what is the distinguishing feature of the temple? Is it not the presence of God in that place? That's what made the temple on earth the temple. It was because the Shekinah glory was there and the tabernacle beforehand. That's what made it the special place. It was the fact that the Lord's presence was known there upon the mercy seat. So whether it was in the tabernacle or later on in the temple, there the presence of the Lord was known. Ezekiel highlights the presence of the Lord leaving that place and it just becoming an empty facade of a building and how the presence of the Lord went to the threshold and then went to 
uh, the mountain over the, the city and finally it left the city altogether and the Lord was withdrawing his presence. It's the presence of the Lord that makes the temple what it is. And in that sense, there is the temple of God in heaven because that's where the Lord's immediate presence is. That's where he manifests his presence. That's where the angels are. That's where the dead in Christ are, awaiting the day of his return. I, I think we could possibly conclude that, well, it could be that temple. Or, or is it possible that there is a third option? Turn over to chapter 21 now of this book of the Revelation and come down to verse 22. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 22. And this portion is dealing here with the New Jerusalem. Maybe we should back up a little and go back to verse 10 where it says, And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Because there's a connection with this in our, in our text in chapter 3 of Revelation in verse 12. And we'll just pick up on it in, in a moment. So Revelation 21 is a portion that is here dealing with the new Jerusalem. And in that portion that has to deal with the new Jerusalem, you come down to verse 22 and it says, I saw no temple therein, for the Lord, the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. The Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Now that, that confirms the, the point that I'm, that I'm making there, that it is the Lord's presence that makes a temple a temple. And in the New Jerusalem, there is going to be the presence of the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. And it's going to be like a temple because the Lord's presence is there. Now, is it more likely that this is what is being referenced when we come back to chapter 3 and verse 12? Because in this verse, chapter 3 and verse 12, there is mention made of the city of our God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from God. There's that statement that is made there very early in the book of the Revelation, but it's only in chapter 21 that you get the whole way through, almost to the end of this chapter, and it's here beginning at verse 10, where John is taken up into the mountain, as, as it were, and he sees the vision of this city. <coughs> it's described as a great city, a holy Jerusalem descending from out of heaven from God. Well, that ties in very much with chapter 3 and verse 12 because there's a city mentioned here. It's called New Jerusalem and it cometh down out of heaven from God. Now, would it be in that place that this word, this phrase, this, this statement is made, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. It is it a reference to that new Jerusalem, that place that is being prepared by the Lord for his people, where the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb, they will be the temple thereof. Is it in that place that the overcomer is going to be looked upon and described as a pillar? A pillar in the temple of my God. That place is a place that is prepared for the Lord and for his, his people. And they will take up residence uh, in it. There's some other references uh, along the way that I think maybe are worth noticing. Revelation 7, uh, verse 15, Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. He that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. And there's those who, who serve him night and day. And they're in his, his temple and Revelation chapter 21 and verse 3, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. So the Lord is going to be with his people. They're going to be near to him. They're going to serve him. It's going to be Jehovah Shammah. The Lord is there. And is it in this place that this uh, fulfillment of these words will come to pass in Revelation 3 and verse 12. I will make a, him a pillar in the temple of my God. There are going to be pillars in the temple of our God. Now the pillar in the building is used for support or 
It is used for ornamentation or for both. There can be ornamental pillars that are also uh, giving support to the roof of the building. But there are uh, magnificent buildings, wonderfully ornate, uh, and they have pillars in them, part of their architecture. And they catch the eye, they make the the person to stop and to marvel at, at such intricate beauty. And they're, they're conspicuous for their position and their prominence, pleasing to, to the eye. They were like the pillars in the temple. You see, the, the, the metaphors that are used in, in the book of the Revelation very often already appear somewhere in the Word of God, in a sense for us to refer to and to, to consider. And if you go back to 1 Kings chapter 7, and you, you read there about the pillars that were in the temple that Solomon built. First Kings chapter 7 and beginning at verse 15. It's a reference here to uh, Hiram who Solomon employed. And it says, For he cast two pillars of brass of eighteen cubits high apiece, and a line of twelve cubits did compass either of them about, And he made two chapters of molten brass to set upon the tops of the pillars. And if you read on down there, we we just don't have the the time uh, this evening to do so. But right down to verse 22, there's a whole description here of these two pillars that were found in the temple. And if you come down to verse 21, And he set up the pillars in the porch of the temple, and he set up the right pillar and called the name of it Jachin, and he set up the left pillar and called the name thereof Boaz. And upon the top of the pillars was lily work. So was the work of the pillars finished. So there are these, these two pillars that are mentioned in the temple that Solomon made. And they were there for, for beauty, maybe there as well for, for support to uh, the structure of the house as well, although it would, it would tell us there that they were in the porch of that building. So it may well be that it was more for ornamentation than, than for anything else. There were these two magnificent pillars that, that uh, drew the eye and made people to observe them as they would have gone into to the temple and each one of them had, had a name. And then when we come over to chapter 3 and verse, Revelation 3 and verse 12, we read here about this promise. The Lord is going to make the overcomer a pillar in the temple of his God. Surely there's to be some connection with the pillars in that temple. And the the thought here is that the Lord is going to to honor the overcomer. Those who keep the faith, those who hold fast, are going to be afforded a place of prominence. They're going to be given a a prominent position in the New Jerusalem. Now remember in the New Testament what Paul had to say of Peter, James and John. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 9, he calls these men pillars in the church. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 9. And when James, Cephas, or Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. So Paul here is referring to these three prominent individuals, Peter, James, and John, as they're commonly known. And he describes them as pillars. Pillars because they were prominent men in the New Testament church. They were foremost apostles, as we know, disciples, followers of the Lord Jesus, who had been with the Savior during his his earthly ministry. And Paul says, these men are pillars in the church. They've got such a prominent place. They're such prominent men. Well, when we bring all of that together that you can glean from elsewhere in the Word of God and you come back to this statement in Revelation 3 and verse 12, Surely there is the thought here of the Lord giving prominence to the overcomer. That individual who holds fast and who doesn't give up that which uh, they have. That which has come down to them. The faith once revealed unto the saints. And they're going to hold fast. And they're going to stand against the tide of, of the age. The Lord says, I'll give them a prominent place. I'll give them a prominent place in the temple of my God. 
And is it the case that in that future day when the people of God occupy the New Jerusalem, prominent places will be given to those who have been overcomers and have held the line? And may we therefore indeed be encouraged this evening to hold the line and not to give up that which we have. Oh, may the Lord make us overcomers in, in this sense. Now, the second thing I want you to consider here is that not only is the overcomer described as a temple pillar, but I want you to notice that the overcomer shall be ascribed immortality. That brings us to the other phrase uh, that is found there in verse 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And he shall go no more out. This is said of the overcomer. The wording in, in the original uh, has a double negative, and we've mentioned double negatives in this study before, and the fact that they're there for, for emphasis. That, that phrase actually could read, and out no never shall he go any more. There's, there's, there's an emphasis here on, on this. And out no never shall he go any more. That's the portion of, of the overcomer. That he will go no more out of this temple or out of the new Jerusalem that is mentioned here. That the, the Lord, the God, Lord God Almighty and the Lamb or the temple uh, thereof. You see, for a period of time there will be a coming and going in and out of the new Jerusalem. If you turn over to chapter 21 of the book of the Revelation and look at the last four verses of that chapter. And notice what is said here about this new Jerusalem. Revelation 21, 24, it says, And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honour into it. Into it. What is it? It is the, it is the city. That's what is mentioned there in the, the previous verses. Some of them we've already uh, made mention of this evening. Verse 25, The gates of it shall not be shut at all by day. For there shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and honour of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So it would suggest to us that for a period of time there is a going in and out of this new Jerusalem. The gate of this city is opened. It specifically says that there in verse 25. The gates of it shall not be shut at all by day. And as there is no night there, these gates are going to be opened all the time, it would suggest to us. And there's going to be a coming and going. The nations of the earth are going to come to it. They're going to bring honor and glory into it. They're going to come and worship the Lord who's in the city. Remember the, that, that previous verse there, verse 22, I saw no temple therein for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. The Lord is going to be here. He's going to tabernacle among his people and there are going to be these nations that are going to bring honour and glory into this city. So it suggests to us that there is a going in and out. That the, the gates of this city are open for a period of time. But then there comes a time when the gates are shut. Is there a possible contrast here in Revelation 3 and this uh, letter to this church at, Phil at Philadelphia? Is there a contrast there between what is happening now that the door is going to be shut or the gate is going to be shut and they're going to go out no more and the open door that is mentioned in the, the previous verses that we've drawn to your attention? We mentioned the fact that this church was presented with an open door. An open door that nobody could close is how it is described in verse 8. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man uh, can shut it. No man can shut it. And if we go back to the, the previous verse, it says there, He that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. So when the Lord opens a door, no man can shut it. When the Lord shuts a door, no man can open it. And at the start of this uh, epistle, he says to this church, there's an open door set before you and nobody can close it. I have opened it and if I open it, it's going to remain open. But now when we come to verse 12 and the promise to the overcomer, the promise is you're not going to go out of it anymore. No, not ever. Not ever are you going to go out anymore. 
So there is now a door that is shut or a gate that is shut. And if God, as he says, if God shuts it, no man can open it. No man can open it. And that's true in uh, general in the Lord's dealings with us. If God opens a door for us, no man can shut it. And on the other hand, if the Lord shuts a door, nobody will ever open it. Nobody will ever open it. Paul speaks about the door being shut for various places that he wanted to go and preach. Because the Lord shut those doors and took him down to Troas and then over the sea to, into Europe and to Philippi and to preach the gospel to, to Europeans. And it is a reminder of, of, of life in general. When the Lord opens a door, nobody can shut it. When the Lord shuts a door, nobody can open it. But we're thinking here in particular reference to the overcomer. And what is being suggested to us here? Is there the suggestion here of Im immutability? Is that the promise that is here being set before the overcomer? In recent weeks we have been thinking about the blessing of incorruption and immortality. But can we add to those, not only the thought of incorruption and immortality, but can we also add to this the thought of Im immutability? The Lord is going to so bless us and bring us into such a position that there's never going to be any change. There's never going to be any reversing of this. Horatius Bonner, writing upon this very verse, this is what he had to say, and I quote, Their home is the innermost shrine in the heaven of heavens. Like Jackin and Boaz, there they stand forever. And he's referring to the overcomer. Their innermost, their home is the innermost shrine of the heaven of heavens. They shall stand forever. There is the thought here <coughs> of immutability. Forever. This is going to last forever. They were witnesses for Christ here on earth with a little strength. And they were holding fast here in the world. But they're going to be pillars forevermore bearing testimony to him who has redeemed them and brought them home to glory, and they shall be there with him forevermore. There forevermore. There's a number of times that little phrase, forevermore, or forever and ever, uh, appears in, in this books, quite often referring to the Lord himself, for he is the one who is forever and ever. He is the eternal God, it refers also to the lost who are tormented forever and ever. That's what makes hell such an awful place. It is forever. There is no ending to hell and to the torments of a lost eternity. And if you are listening this evening and you're not saved, my friend, you cannot, you cannot go to a lost eternity. You ought to flee to Jesus Christ. You might live without Christ, but you cannot afford to die without him. You cannot afford to go out into eternity without him because you will go to that place that this book here in Revelation says that their torment is forever and ever. But I want you to turn over to chapter 22 and verse 5 of this, chap of this book. Chapter 22 and verse 5. And it says, There, there shall be no, can no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. They shall reign forever and ever. Well, the Lord will give to his people immutability. That eternal state that he will bring them into will be a state from which they will never, ever leave. And just as the torments of hell last forever, so also do the joys of heaven. They will last forever and forever. And there comes that time when the gate of the new Jerusalem is shut and nobody goes out and nobody comes in. And the eternal state is fixed. Fixed forevermore. And what, what a blessing belongs to the overcomer. Well, they, might, they might be despised in this world and their, their name might be trampled in the, in the street. But the Lord will so bless the overcomer.
There's one final uh, thought here I want us to consider, and that is that the overcomers shall be inscribed with glorious names. Revelation 3 and 12 goes on to say that, And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. So there are actually three inscriptions here that are highlighted. These are inscriptions that are written by Jesus Christ himself. He is the speaker here. He is the great king and sole head of the church who has been described by John in chapter 1 as the one whom he heard the voice from behind him and he looked round and he saw and he saw a vision of Jesus Christ and he started to describe that vision and then he started to record what that individual had to say. So these are the words of the Lord Jesus. These are the words of the great king and the head of the church. And it is he himself who is saying, I am going to do the inscribing. I am going to write upon them these inscriptions. Now remember that upon Christ himself there are inscriptions. We'll not turn over again, but you can look it up if you desire. Revelation 19 and verse 16, it says there, And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. So there, there is a, this inscription that is on Jesus Christ. On his vesture, on his garments, and on his thigh, there is a name written. King of kings and Lord of lords. There's inscriptions that Jesus Christ has. Well, there are inscriptions that his, his overcomers have. He's going to mark out these overcomers. He's going to mark them out as if he's, he's put an inscription upon them. And if we take them one by one here, first of all, there is this inscription uh, with the name of my God. That's the first one in verse 12. I will write upon him the name of my God. Is that the name of Jehovah? Is there here a reference to the high priest in Israel with the golden plate upon the mitre that he wore on his head as part of the high priestly garments? It had holiness to the Lord. Exodus 28 Verses 36 to 38, you read about it there and how there was that plate of gold inscribed into that gold plate. There were those words, holiness to the Lord. Well, the saints and their heavenly royal priesthood shall bear his name openly as those who are consecrated unto him. Just as Aaron was consecrated unto the Lord. That's the thought in that, that's, that statement, holiness unto the Lord. Aaron was, Aaron was a consecrated unto the Lord, set apart for that particular work of being the high priest. Here's the Lord going to set apart the overcomer. Mark them out. Put an inscription upon them. Write upon them the name of his God. Will they bear that special name of Jehovah that has so much to do with the character of God? It was said to Moses in chapter 6, verses 2 and 3, that the Lord had not made himself known by this name to Abraham. It's not that Abraham didn't know the name Jehovah, because you go back to Genesis and you'll find that he did. But what it's referring to is the outworking of that name, because it has the idea of a covenant-keeping God. And in Moses' day, the promises made to Abraham in covenant were going to be fulfilled the Lord was going to take Israel out of, of Egypt and bring them into the promised land. And in that sense, Moses was going to see him as Jehovah, as the covenant keeping God fulfilling his word. The Lord's going to mark out the overcomer in the new Jerusalem. He's going to put his name, the name of my God, upon them. The name of Jehovah. Jehovah. Somebody who held fast. Somebody who wouldn't give up the truth, but held fast in an evil day. They're going to be marked out. They're going to be inscribed with the name of the Lord. What a contrast. There's, there's other inscriptions that are here mentioned in the book of the Revelation. There, there's that which belongs to those who follow the, the Antichrist, the beast, 
In Revelation 13 and verse 16, he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand and, or in their forehead, so that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. There's those who are, who are marked out and inscribed. And in that sense, there are those that are also connected there in chapter um, 17 and verse 5 with the harlot of mystery Babylon Be upon her forehead was a name written mystery Babylon the great the mother of harlots an abomination of the earth and there's some other inscriptions that you wouldn't want anything to do with but here's an inscription to seek after and to follow and to desire in Revelation 3 and verse 12 the promise to the overcomer I will inscribe upon him the name of my God and then also there's the second of these inscriptions, and it is to be inscribed with the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem. So he's going to be inscribed with the, the name of the city. And we've mentioned there about the fact that this city cometh down out of heaven from God. God is the maker of this city. It tells us that in Hebrews about those who sought for a city whose builder and maker was God. In Hebrews 11 verse 16 it says, Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. There is a city prepared for his people, for those who seek after it. And in the name of this city is going to be engraven upon these pillars in connection with the name of the builder and the maker of this city. Those who are pillars just like those names that were put upon the, the pillars in the temple in 1 Kings 7. There's going to be the inscription upon these pillars in the temple of the Lord. They're going to take on this name, the name of the city of my God. They're going to be connected with the one who is the builder and the maker. They're citizens. They're going to have an entitlement for this city, even an entitlement for a place of prominence in this city. No, they're going to be marked as those who belong to this city. I wonder, have we the marks about us even tonight as to where we belong? Have we the marks about us that we belong to the Lord? Or do we have the marks of the world about us? Marks of the unsaved, the ungodly, the careless, the carnal? What kind of marks do we have upon us? May it be the mark of, of those who belong to the Lord. The last one, very quickly, is there at the end of verse 12. I will write upon him my new name. Now remember, this is Christ who is speaking. And it would seem to suggest to us, and there's a number of commentators who, who pick up on this point, that there is a new name that is going to be given to Christ that we do not yet know. There is a new name that will yet be given to Jesus Christ that is not known on earth. That name will be known in heaven. That name will be known in the city of the New Jerusalem. He will write it upon those who are overcomers. Oh, not only will he be given that new name himself, some peculiar honor and blessedness that will be placed upon him that we do not know what it is as yet, but there will be something that will identify him and will be given to him as a name that will exalt him. And rightly so, for the Lamb is all the glory in Emmanuel's land. But he in turn is going to inscribe it upon the overcomer. The person who has been faithful, who has kept, as verse 10 says, kept the word of my patience. Held fast to the Saviour's word. The Lord is going to give them this singular honor. He's going to write upon them his new name. Oh, what a, what a singular honor indeed. And may we desire to be overcomers. May we know that power and victory in our lives, holding fast even in this day and age, holding fast that we might have the blessings of the overcomer that's mentioned in this, this portion of Scripture. I trust the Lord will bless his word this evening to all of our hearts as we have thought upon it. May we rejoice in these truths and may they stir our hearts to pursue after 
the things of God and through Christ be more than overcomers. May the Lord bless his word for his name's sake. We're going to bow together in prayer. Our Father, bless thy word to us as we have pondered these things and sought to understand them. Even in the light of the word of God elsewhere, we pray that, Lord, thou would shine the light into our own souls. And may we be those who are more than overcomers through him who loved us. Grant thy blessing to us now as we continue on and as the time of prayer will take place with each one. We pray that, Lord, you'll draw nigh to us and give help as we call upon thy name. We ask for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. 342 is going to be the hymn that we're going to close this part of um, the broadcast with. And then we're encouraging you as normal to have a, a season of prayer whether you're on your own or whether you're with others uh, in your own home, just to take a little time, seek the Lord, pray, call upon his name. Uh, there will be prayer requests that uh, are up on the screen each uh, Bible study broadcast. And uh, from time to time, there's others that are sent out around the congregation as well. So uh, do seek the Lord, please, and do take time. Uh, to wait upon the Lord. So we're going to sing this hymn, 342. The King of love my shepherd is, whose goodness faileth never. I nothing lack of I am his, and he is mine forever. May the Lord bless uh, each one as the time of prayer does take place. And if you ever want to contact us, there will be contact details on the screen as well. May the Lord bless. <laughs>